Not this sin offering, but this offering was for the priest. And what I describe that as is not for his sin, not Jesus, not the New Testament, not the high priest in the New Testament, not for his sin, but this offering was something only Jesus could do. It was done as the mediator. It was done for us. We were not there. We were not included. He went in for us. Now, do the scriptures in the New Testament not say that, that he went in for us? Yes, there are plenty of scriptures that, that describe that action. And I believe that that is represented by the bullock. But now we're getting into the goats. And one of the goats was killed. And as we just read, its blood was sprinkled in exactly, in fact, the whole process was done exactly the same way as the bullock. So um, there is this truth of substitution, and there's another truth called identification. Is that man or devil? <clears throat> so many of you are sort of familiar with the, these, this contrast of substitution and identification. It's big stuff that you should know. Substitute means that Jesus did it for you. He was your substitute. Okay? Substitution is nothing more than he's a substitute. But folks, identification is that you're identifying with him in it. That's a whole different aspect. The bullock represents substitution. The goat represents identification. Both were true. Jesus did something for us. Jesus did something as us. You find scriptures on both of those, on all of that. So, um, so the first time he enters into the Holy of Holies, he's doing it as a substitute. He's doing it for us. He's doing it as a mediator. He's doing it as a forerunner. He's doing it with the bullock. The second time that he enters in, he does it as one with us, and that represents the goat, and that's as I, in identification and that's him doing it with us or as us, but we're with him in that, okay? So that's why when it gets to that part, it says, uh, what is it, verse 4? And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and it gives all the specifics. But then verse 15 says, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. In other words, he doesn't describe again the process because he's saying you're doing exactly what he did what he did now you're doing it with him does that make sense he doesn't have to describe the process again and that what that tells you is that if you know what jesus did strictly as a forerunner strictly as a mediator strictly as a substitute then you can make a tremendous leap in your relationship and knowledge of the scriptures and of the Lord by understanding by that that bullock did that alone, but the goat represents the fact that he also did it as us and we're included in all that so that in that he died, we died. In that he was buried, we were buried with him. In that he was raised, we were raised unto newness of life. Isn't that an interesting way of putting it? It didn't say we were raised up. It says we were raised unto newness of life. The resurrection for us is not up. The resurrection for us is a him. Hand raised? Raised unto sacred life. Because that is, that is what has come up in us. That is the Jesus said that. I am the resurrection. And the word I am is past, present, and future. I am. I mean, if he's the I am, then he, I am on Monday, and I am on Wednesday, and I am on Friday, and I am on January, or in January, and in December. I am at the beginning and the end. I am Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last. I am 
represents something more than I do. I do is a mediator. I do this for you, but when it's done, I no longer work on your behalf to get you to God. You're now with God. You don't need a mediator. Now we commune together in that. Does that, does that make sense? That, that, that when he says I am, he's speaking of the eternal life that we've received. He's speaking of an eternal relationship. He's not speaking of something that he did, something he accomplished. You can, folks, you can say that there's a past finished work. How many of you believe that there's a past finished work? Raise your hand. Good. Well, that's good because there is. However, if, that, if a past finished work was all what it was all about, then everything would be focused on 2,000 years ago where the past finished work happened. Do you understand what I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to? There's a, okay, there's a past finished work. Then I don't live not right now. I live in the past of what he finished. But there's more to the story than a past finished work. There's more to this life than just pointing back to something. There's something that it is, that as I am, I am the resurrection, I am the life, I am the truth, I am the way. All of that, he didn't say, I passed, finished, worked the way. I passed, finished, worked the truth. You, you see what I'm saying? And yeah, you draw from that, there is a reality of that, but folks, in, in the greater truth, you're not drawn from what happened 2,000 years ago, you're drawn from him who is that now. And is that to me now? Let me be specific here. Not just that he's alive now. That's not my point. My point is that, that he is this to me now. And the now Jesus is that to me. Beloved, 2,000 years ago you became the sons of God. No. Beloved, now are you the sons of God. See? So, and, and you know, sometimes I get off on stuff like that to keep us balanced because maybe we've leaned too far one direction. So I have to do that, but at the same time, then I have to come back and say, now I understand that there's a past finished work and thank God for it and I'm not putting that down and we all should remember that and should all draw from that and should have a, a, be a reality in our heart and that is true. Everything I'm telling you is true. But, the Holy Spirit is having me emphasize to you that Jesus is what it's about. Not Jesus of 2,000 years ago. He was, but he also is. And he is to come. That's, you ever wonder why a ring constitutes union? A ring does not constitute marriage. I'm sorry, but a ring does not constitute marriage. A ring constitutes union. And you say, well, where do you get that from, Brother Randy? You come up with some wild-haired sort of things. Where do you get that from? Well, because a ring represents something that's unending, right? A circle is unending, unending. But a lot of marriages end. Can I get an amen on that? There it is. That is just a fact. A lot of them end. So, you know, when they, when they divorce, they should just get a hacksaw, cut through it, and open it up. Get a hammer, flatten it straight, and go, oh, it went this long. You know? <laughs> you know? Or when they get married, they ought to hand them a little, a little gold stick. <laughs> you know? Here, we're married. And here's your gold stick. <laughs> That, that, because why? Because that represents marriage. But union is eternal. There is no end to it. That's why folks don't ever get married, get joined. Come on. I'm telling you the truth. Don't, you know, some of you single guys are going, don't worry, I ain't ever going to get married. <laughs> but I mean, you know, don't get married. If, you, if anything, get joined, because you get joined in one, that never ends. <clears throat> okay? Why am I bringing that up at this point? Because the I am never ends. And we can talk forever about the I do or the I did. 
the idea 2,000 years ago. And that helps you in a lot of ways, but folks, I want Jesus, and I want him now, and I want the reality of him now. I don't want to just rest on what he did, whether it was two weeks ago. You know, we would say, we would say well, I don't rest on what Jesus did 30 years ago for me when I found Jesus. You know, I, I want him today. Well, don't do it in this eternal realm of knowing the truth either. It goes back a little further than that, but it's don't rest in that. Rest in him and the living Jesus and the present reality of the Lord. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so, there, so Jesus did do a mediator work. He did, but that's over. When, you, when you're in between, you're standing in, I mean, it'd be like if I had somebody right here and they were having a hard time with somebody over here and I was the mediator, okay, I'd say to you, okay, now you're going to, we're going to work this out, okay? And, and I'd say, we're going to work this out, okay? Are you at least willing for us to try to work it out? And say, yeah, I'm willing, but I don't know, you know? But, you know, but I'm some sort of wine-dangling Dr. Phil dude, and I go, okay, and by the time I get through, man, they are, you know, I bring them together. Folks, I step out of the picture and go away, and they live in union. If you understand what I mean, they have a union now. They don't need me anymore if they're together. They don't need me as a mediator. As a mediator. That's a finished work. It's great. It's a great work, and you should study it and know it, but that's not today. He ever liveth to make intercession for us, and that intercession relates to communion and what is, what is settled, but it's settled in his heart, not just settled over there. I tell you what, you can learn the facts of what's settled and get in trouble when circumstances go wrong, but when you know it's settled in his heart, that just does something for you, you know? You know, we're always trying to get it settled in our heart. You know, it'd be like a wife going, you know, well, are we really one? You know? And uh, my wife would do stuff like that. I hate to do this behind her back, but let me tell you what she used to do. No. <clears throat> no, but she used to, you know, she'd go, you know, something would go wrong or she would feel a little ruffled about something, not upset, but I mean, you know, like, is, it, is everything okay? I mean, she still does that to me all the time, you know? Are you mad? She did that to me today. Are you upset with me? No. You know, she woke up at 4.30 this morning, freaked out over a dream. I mean, <gasps> ah, you know, and I, I woke up, grabbed her, and held her, and said, it's okay, everything's okay, it's fine, fine, fine. You know, and she laid back down, and I held her for a while until she went into deep sleep, and I didn't go back to sleep. <laughs> you know? So I've been, I've been tired. I've been tired. And so... We're about doing stuff and everything, but I'm sort of quiet because I'm tired. Are you mad at me? No, I'm just tired. Are you sure? You know. Well, why, why would you think that I'm mad at you? Did I go, or am I going like, I just don't know if I like you anymore, anything like that. You, you understand, what I mean? Any, anything like, anything like that. No, it just felt, you know, I just felt something. Like what? Tiredness? Did tiredness end the marriage? You know, and it's only been a few days ago that we celebrated 36 years. Did but now I'm tired. <laughs> you see, it doesn't make sense, but it, it, has, it has more of a profound effect when you hear it coming from his heart because you're learning his heart and you're going, this is settled with him. My God, what is wrong with me? Anybody ever gone through, you know? And you go, it's, he's, he's okay. And when you find out he's okay, you go, well, I'm okay. <laughs> you know? And, but the key is not to learn the facts of it, but the heart of it from him. That's knowing him today. That's not knowing what he did. That's knowing that it's settled in his heart today because that's how he is. <clears throat> All right, so um, <clears throat> so when it talks about that the blood, he said basically this, do with the blood like you did with the bullock. 
Remember that? Do with the blood of the goat like he did with the bullock. Now, the bullock is, is a bull, an oxen, a baby bull, which represents service and strength. So that represents the Lord, not, not sin or whatever, service and strength. But the goat, oh baby, the goat. What is the symbol of Satanism? Goat head. You didn't know that? Well, okay, next class I'm going to teach you all about Satanism. <laughs> Not really. Just kidding. Um, but, yeah, you know, I mean, that's the, the symbol is a goat head. And so that represents who? Jesus? No, us, but Jesus, he who knew no sin was made to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the goat represents us with him, whereas the bullock just represents him. All right, so it says, do with the blood uh, as, as you did with the bullock. This shows that whatever happened to Jesus happened to us also. Whatever happened to the bullock happened to you, Mr. Goat. You see, I'm trying to put this in simple terms, but, you know. And he's saying that to, he's saying that to him, to the goat, people, <laughs> all of us, that are without Christ or not serving him, whatever he's already done as a pure bullock is going to happen to you. You are one with him in this endeavor. You're not, he's not just doing it for you. <clears throat> all right. So the body of the Lord's goat is also burned outside the camp. And, and I won't get into that again, but I've shown you there in, uh, what is it, Hebrews 13, 13, I think that's what it is. Oh my God. You know what that means, don't you? Nothing. <laughs> no. It just means it's Hebrews 13. But it says, just like the shadow, when those beasts were killed outside the camp, so Jesus, so the first one is the shadow, second one, so Jesus also was crucified out the camp. And then he brings it right into our life and says, so let us. There's our identification. He says, just like the bullock was, so as the goat will follow through with the same thing. Amen. You see? All right. So, um, we're, let, let me just read because I don't remember what this says here. We're told as, as goats identified with the bullock to go to him outside the camp because he's the bullock. And the bullock is offered, put outside the camp, and the goat also ends up, the body of the goat also ends up outside the camp. <clears throat> now, there is this thing, and I'm just going to read what I, I had this written a long time ago, but I just want to make sure that it's clear. It is not that there is merit in the Lord's goat as in the bullock but it is the body's recognition of the work and union of our being dead together with Christ, which is what it says in Romans 6, 8 and Colossians 2, 2, that we are dead together with him. Does it not say that? That we are dead together with him. And so there is no merit in us going outside the camp, merit in the sense of atonement. Do you, do you understand that? We're not, you know... For example, you can lay down your life for, for the brethren. It says in uh, 1 John 3.16, By this perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay? Okay, if we lay down our lives for the brethren, does that, does that mean that they're going to be saved, or everything they're going to get right? Or there's no, there's no guarantee on any of that. It's certainly not a work of atonement not atonement but it is a work of we are bearing about in the body the dying of the lord folks that's not your dying you're not supposed to be bearing about your dying you're supposed to be bearing about his dying what does that mean that's the difference between you quote unquote trying to die to sin which folks you don't die to sin you're dead to sin okay you reckon yourself dead to sin but there is a, a dying that goes on, you could say daily, taking up the cross daily. There is a death, but that's not you dying to sin. That's you having this self-giving, sacred life 
laying down himself through you for others. Okay? So there's no guarantee that anybody will ever get any benefit from it, but we have the promise that life comes out of death, right? Uh, what is that, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, thereabouts, something like that? But folks, I just want to make this clear. In truth, life doesn't come out of death. Life comes out of his death. When it's you bearing about his dying, life can come forth. So all of my trying to be spiritual and, you know, give myself and do all this stuff, well, that's, that's great, but let's not do it without the lamb. Let's not do it without him giving himself through us. Let's not become messiahs and saviors on our own because we're not. But we can... We can bear about the dying of the Lord Jesus in us, the self-giving nature, the sacred life of the Lamb pouring himself through us. So, uh, and, and then I wrote, it's not uh, atonement, but it is the body's recognition of the work and union of our being dead with him, because we are dead together with Christ, and the scriptures declare that. It is our acceptance and joining by knowledge into what Christ has given before and what was done by the bullock. By, by being the goat, we're acknowledging what the bullock did. And we're saying, we're just one with that same spirit that the bullock did by himself, but that spirit is now in us, and it's Christ in us. And they're self-giving, but it is by Christ. And if he didn't give himself, we could never give ourselves. It is our recognition of his, the bullock self-giving apart from us that we can even comprehend how this is supposed to work as Christians. Am I making sense here? Is this good? Pardon? <laughs> well, good. That's good. Because, I, I mean, this is really great stuff. And, I mean, it really, this stuff, you know, that says the truth will make you free. You know, let me tell you, I'm so stubborn, the truth's going to have to make me. It's kind of like growing up in the hood like I did in Oak Cliff. You, well, you make me. You know, you go do so-and-so. You make me. Well, I'm sorry, but it's almost like the Lord. You have to say, well, you make me. But he does make me by Christ, not making, like I said, purifying the silver so that now it's proud of itself because it's pure. No, it's proud of itself because it's reflecting the, the workman who, who did it to him, who brought it about. And all your, your thanks and all of your joy and all of your hopes lie within him and him alone and not in yourself. But this is good news, you know. Sometimes it takes a while to come to a, an end of ourself in these things. But, um, but Jesus on that throne, now this, I don't want to confuse you by using another term, but I want, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this in. I, we've been using the bullock as that example, but the truth is, in eternity, in the book of Revelation, the lamb actually is a better picture of that self-giving nature on the throne in the book of Revelation. It's not a bullock, it's a lamb. Am I right or wrong? I mean, that's pretty much all throughout. It's giving the lamb. It hardly ever uses the name Jesus in the book of Revelation. It just calls him the lamb. 22 times, I think. That's a lot, yeah. And that's, that's Jesus now in eternity. When you're going to know him in eternity, you don't go, hey, Jesus, what's happening? You know what I mean? You're going, lamb of God. Because you, you, you know him by his essence not by his earth name and works and stuff like that. And so, so there is that scripture, uh, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Who's that talking? Goat. Goat. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Who's that? That's not me. That's the lamb or the bullock, however you want to look at it. But that's the one that's living now is the self-giving one. But when he says, I am crucified, he's talking about the goat. And when he says, nevertheless, not I, but Christ liveth in me, 
that's the lamb or that's the bullock. That's the one who gave himself and always gives himself because it's sacred life. Sacred life. All right. Um, and, and there is this thing, I, I, let's see, I may, I don't want to jump ahead, so I might just not make that statement yet. <clears throat> All right, so in Leviticus 16 and verse 5, he says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats. Okay, kids of the goats. Uh, I was a missionary in Jamaica, and part of our deal was that I had to keep track of the goats, which was exciting because I was raised in Oak Cliff, and, you know, the only goats there were old goats. <clears throat> That's old people. That's what we called them back then. Somebody knows them. You old goat. But anyway, sorry. <clears throat> um, but but the, the correct word for a baby goat is a kid. The correct word for a baby goose is a gosling. The correct, never mind, I, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Take you as far as I can. So when it says a kid of the goat, it's talking about a little, just like in, in Revelation, a little lamb is the true meaning there. Lamb is a baby sheep, right? Kid is a baby goat. I'm not going to get into that right now, but I just want to make sure that that's, that's clear. <clears throat> um, so there are two of them. They're presented before the door. Aaron cast lots. One is the Lord's goat. It dies. You know, if you were one of those goats, you'd go, uh, okay, which one of you two goats want to be the Lord's goat? Oh, me, me, me. I want to be the Lord's goat. Okay, you, you win, you die. You know. Oh, I want to be the chosen of the Lord. I, I want to be the chosen one. Yeah. Okay. You, I pick you out of the flock. You come over here, lay down on the altar. <laughs> See, we got this all mixed up. We've got all, we, you know what? We've come up with a whole new religion that doesn't include the Old Testament as a fulfillment of things so that we don't even use the Old Testament. We just use those terms in the New Testament to our understanding without any real meaning. The chosen was a big deal back then, but today it's, you know, that means you're special. S-P-E-C-I-A-L. Special, I'm special. Anyway. <clears throat> Jesus, get this, I'm special, I'm special, S-P-E-C-I-L, I'm special, I'm special, Jesus loves me like nobody else, nobody else, nobody else. Oh, he loves you like nobody else. Wow. I, I got news for you, he loves you the way, as, as he loves Jesus. I read that in John 17, it blew my mind. He loves you just like he loves Jesus because you're one with Jesus. You're not different and special. There's, there's something better than different and special. It's called one. Even though it's the loneliest number you'll ever do. <clears throat> All right. So, um, so the Lord's goat, it dies, and the other is the scapegoat, and that goat is let loose in the wilderness. Um, one is killed, and the other is left alive. And this signifies the two sides of self-giving, one in death and the other while yet living. Where do you find that at? Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living sacrifice. Folks, there is an aspect of death. See, this is one, this is one offering. Two goats, one offering. Can I get an amen? Two goats, one offering. One dies, one lives in death. Do you, you know, do you comprehend that? Or do you have a doctrine of death with Jesus 2,000 years ago and you live free, if you understand what I'm saying? But he said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay? And so... Um, 
This one goat uh, that is let loose in the wilderness is called a zezel. Is that the proper pronunciation? And um, the, the goat that is killed, it follows in the exact footsteps of the bullock. But I got news for you. This other goat, it's also going in the footsteps, but not of the bullock. It's going in oneness. It's going, it is the ongoing, I'm going to say it like this. This is a lousy way to put it, but it's the ongoing mistreatment of Jesus through his body. Just, that's the best way I could come up with it right now. Um, the two goats both have a part in the atonement. One is dead and the other one is living. Now, I didn't see it in my notes here, but I want to make this clear. We always think that the high priest takes that goat, the one he's going to kill, and they lay hands on it, and the high priest lays his hands on it, and he confesses all of the sins on that goat and then takes him in and kills him on the altar. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Instead, he lays his hands on the goat that's going to wander in the wilderness and puts all the sins on it. That's really different. It's because we always think, yeah, we laid our sins on it, and then Jesus took it to the cross and died, and that did away with it. But there's a whole other aspect of bearing about in the body, the, the, this, the sufferings, of Christ in the body and all these things. And so, uh, like I said, I may have it here. So on the Day of Atonement, all the sins, here it is, were not put on the goat that died, but on the one that lived. He is sent to a place where you will not run into them again. This is, uh, and I've got, if, you, if you're writing scriptures, you may want these because they're real good. Psalm 103, verse 12. These are all the ones that he has cast your sin as far as the east is from the west, and he's cast them in the sea of forgetfulness. So these are all those scriptures to show what he did, and that's, I'll say them again, Psalm 103, verse 12, Micah 7, 19, Hebrews 10, 1 through 12, which is the whole story there. Now, here's our thought. He cast them in the sea of forgetfulness. He cast them into as far as the east is from the west, that's what the scripture says. But folks, what he does is he casts them into this goat and then sends this goat out into the wilderness. And you know what's in the wilderness. Number one, it says a land uninhabited. So none of the good people are out there. And beasts are out there. And they are looking for something to rip to shreds. Okay. And so he's sent out there, and that's the one who's carrying all the sin. So that everyone that would see it, every beast or everyone that would see it would go, see, he, there's the sinner, there's the bad person. And I'm, not, I'm trying not to get into this too much, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. But can look there and would see that and go, there's what's wrong. There's the sin. There's, we're clean. We're free. Is this making sense to anybody? This is not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. This is happening to the goats, not just the bullet. That's, that's important. All right, so, um, so, so when it says he's cast as far as the east is from the west or in the sea of forgetfulness, actually there is no sea of forgetfulness. There's no actual sea of forgetfulness. The sea of forgetfulness is the wilderness where he sends this goat so that this goat is rejected and is not supposed to show up where the inhabited transgressors are. It's supposed to be isolated. And, and can you imagine? Can you imagine Israel 
a week after the Day of Atonement, and they're all out in the streets celebrating in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden this scapegoat comes walking down the middle of the street in Jerusalem. They're all going, oh my God, it's all of our sins, it's gone wrong. And brings up all of the thought of their stuff, all their stuff, oh my God, oh no, it's back, oh no, and going through all this stuff, this horror, it must be bandished and sent away for their sake. Let us go unto him. There is a whole reality behind this that is filled with life and filled with the understanding of the Lord. And this is why being reviled he reviled not. Being accused, he didn't justify himself. He didn't try to cover himself. He said, well, you believe what you want to believe because I'm going to be bearing this. And he did. See, he didn't just die. And if you'll think about it, folks, you ever hear somebody use the name of Buddha in vain? Or any other god or whatever? You know. You know, you never hear it. Jesus' name is the one used. Jesus is the name that's become a cuss word. Jesus is the name that is slandered. Jesus is the one that is attacked. And Jesus in his body, folks, there is no difference with him now. I'm telling you, there is no difference now. It's, it's Jesus in us. It's his life. That's why Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Well, yeah, we're one. We're his body. It's this, they're persecuting the same person. <laughs> you know, he just looks a little different in this part of the body, you know. He looks different in my finger than he does in my liver. Almost said my gizzard, but we don't have a gizzard. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, let me try to wrap this up pretty quick here. Once he went in for us as a forerunner and substitute, that means crucified for us, Romans 8, 5 says he was crucified for us. That means when it says for us, it's a forerunner, it's a substitute, it's a mediator, okay? But, but uh, once he, he went in for us as a forerunner and substitute, then he went in as us. The goat still represents Christ, but Christ as us and with us. One as mediator and the other as in covenant. And then I was going to make this statement earlier. Only one man, only one man entered into the Holy of Holies. We think that the difference is, the new covenant is, that Jesus lets a whole bunch of people come in now. Not true. What he does is still only one man goes in, but he makes us his body. Do you understand the difference? We're not it's, not, it's not like he goes, okay, everybody can go in now. Let's all rush madly in there. No, no, no. He takes us in in oneness with him. And we enter in by oneness. Why? Because he already went in as a, as a bullock, as a mediator, and made us one. He settled that. Now we're going in together. Okay? So, um, he, go, uh, he goes in one as a mediator and the other as in covenant. So the high priest did not stand before God as many, but as one when he first went in. I'm, I'm finishing this out. This is my, I realize I'm circling back, but I'm really trying to get, get this point in you because... I think it's going to make a big difference down the road. When he first, remember, he goes into the Holy of Holies several times. The first time he does it, he does it by himself. The high priest did not stand before God as many at that point, but as one on behalf of many. Okay? He only appeared, and, and then I guess I should have put, but, but once this whole thing is settled, once it's all settled, what does he do? What does he do? Once he's done all of the stuff, 
he's still in there and he puts back on his high priestly garments with the stones on his heart and on his shoulders and then he steps out and appears to the people like that. that that's really cool. I mean, it's really cool. He didn't have to do that. He could have stayed in those linen clothes, finished everything, and done it. But he steps back out in representation because when he went in as a, with the goat, that represented us. But he didn't have on those things. But we were there. We were there in him. We were there one with him, but not seen. Nobody had seen it yet. It was a heart thing with him. It was a settled thing with him. It was not something that he wore that everyone could see at that point. It's something that was settled first with him, and then he steps out and appears with those stones saying, you're all on my heart, you're all on my shoulders. Then he steps out with one purpose, so they can see what was done by him when nobody else could see it. So they could see it and know that it was true. So I'm not sure how this reads, so let me just try this. He only appeared to the people as many so they could see how this thing was done. But to really see it is to see the one and to believe that you are there with him. Blessed are those who don't see yet believe. That's what Jesus said to Thomas. So, so, there's, so there's two ways of seeing this, that you're one and that he settled this by oneness. One is is by him stepping out finally when it's over and appears and then we look and we see him and we go, he did it, he did it, he, he settled it, he did the mediated work, he did the oneness thing and now I see it. That's one way. The other way is to see him without all the outward trappings of that reality but to see his heart even while he's in fine linen taking that goat in, taking the blood of the goat in and realizing the oneness that is already settled in his heart it has not yet appeared to anyone. It is not clear. It is not manifest. No one can rejoice yet. No one knows it's settled, but it is settled and, and being settled right then and there. And you, you, can, you can look at him in his fine linen with no vest and no stones, but you can see the way he sees it and you can know, though you don't see it, he's there. No, you don't see it. You're there. Do you see the difference? One is, and, and fine, if he steps out and you see it based in manifestation, good, wonderful. But I wrote that it is better, but to really see it is to see the one. That the one is many. Let me just, uh, I'll try to, Try to say it like this. I wrote it in a book, one of mine on the body of Christ. I had a chapter on the many are one, and I had another chapter on the one is many. And I used scriptures that get into all of this, that show this reality. And it's a, just a different angle of the same truth, and that is when he steps out in his high priestly garments with those 12 stones here and those two stones representing all the tribes here, you're seeing the many, many, one, two, three, four, five, six, you're seeing the many and you're believing that you're one. Do you understand? But when he's in his fine linen garments, in, going in, and he's not wearing all of that, folks, you're seeing the one that is many. You don't see the many, you see the one, but you know that the one is many and that we are identified with him in this thing. If you don't know the difference of those things, you need to, it's spelled out real good in that Body of Christ book. Um, it's two different angles. And f it's, it's fine when he steps out and appears, is revealed with all of this. And we go, oh, I see it, I see it. That's wonderful. But there is a seeing that doesn't see you except by seeing him. When you see him, you know you're included. You don't have to see your little stone or your name engraved on it. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to see you. You're content to see him and to believe. Blessed are those who believe yet don't see. 
And they believe because they just see the one. They know the one is many. They don't have to see the many. They see the one and they know the one is many. Whereas the other is seeing the many and going, now I know they're one because they're all on Jesus and we're all one. And you, I see me, so there's my tribe right there. There's my name right up there on his shoulder. And finding our contentment there, that's fine. It's, it's okay. But this thing was settled before they ever saw it. Before he got out there, it had been settled. It wasn't settled when he stepped outside of the tabernacle and appeared to the people. It was settled on his way out of there. And the same is true for us, folks. It's settled. It is settled. And, and it's settled in his heart and it's settled in him as we are found in him. All right, so I guess I'm going to stop now. I hope I got that point across. Anybody getting anything out of this? It is just so my heart's desire that we see beyond a religious book. I just really want Jesus, and I just really want those who are connected with me to really know him and love him. Uh, I'm thinking, um, I've heard uh, Kelly share some, and I've heard Mallory share some on these two goats. And I don't know if y'all want to pursue preparing for next class to talk about it a little bit. Um, I'll maybe give one a turn if you take one class or 10 minutes or whatever turn it over to the other if you take the whole first class you take both classes or you know but um, I believe there are a few angles even if it's just five minutes you know I believe there's a few angles that I could share on but I believe that hearing it in the mouth of two or three witnesses, and I, I just think this area is so important that we get. It's incredible. Nobody talks about it, but it's just life, and it's just reality that we would be in confusion if we didn't understand what was going on. And I don't want you in confusion. I want you in peace. So that's where we're heading with that. So anyway, we'll see how the Lord leads on all this. Father, we just love your son, Jesus. We just love this lamb upon the throne. We just love this sacred life that's called lamb life. And we want him formed in us. We don't want to be like him. We want him formed in us.